Welcome, everyone. So glad that you're here with us this weekend. I want to give a shout out, a happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room, all the dads online. Thank you so much for celebrating with us this weekend. And speaking of Father's Day, there were three kids that were asked to finish the sentence, my dad is so brave, he dot, dot, dot. The first one said, my dad is so brave, he once fought a lion and made it into a trophy. Pretty brave. Second said, my dad is so brave, he once wrestled an elephant to the ground. Then the third one said, my dad is so brave, he once disagreed with my mom. (laughs) Ultimate sign of courage and bravery. Uh, Courage and bravery, they're easier said than done, aren't they? I mean, I think a lot of us in the room probably deal with a lot of fear, a lot of different fears for each one of us, but nonetheless, fear is a part of our lives. And I think it's interesting because studies would show that 85% of the fears that we have will never even happen to us. 85% of the fears that we have will never even happen to us. And of the 15%, the other 15%, we find out that we're way more capable to deal with the fear than we thought that we would be. Which means that we just give fear way too much credit in our lives. We give it way too much room. We tend to lean into fear more than we should. And the authors of the Bible knew this to be true. We see the words fear not 63 times in the Bible. And it tells us not to be controlled by fear by over 300 times. And what's important to realize is that fear is not from God. It's not something that he imparts on us, this feeling of fear. In fact, 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us just this. When we get to the red words here at Central, if you just say those out loud with us. But it says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been in a series called King of Hearts, looking not only at the heart of God, but at the heart of David, who the Bible referred to as a man after God's own heart. In week one, Pastor Judd, he unpacked what gave David this title, this description, and how we too can strive for the same kind of heart, to position ourselves for God's favor. And then last week, Pastor Judd talked about David's worshipful heart, how praise fills our minds and our hearts with the goodness of God and brings healing and hope to others. And they're both incredible messages. If you didn't get a chance to check them out, I highly encourage you to go back and do so, watch those messages. But today, we're gonna be talking about the courageous heart. And to do so, we're gonna be looking at David in the most famous battle in the Old Testament. But this wasn't a battle between two armies. I mean, it was but it was really a battle between two individuals. And it happens to be one of the ultimate examples of courage, the story of David and Goliath. And to set the scene, we're gonna be in the Elah Valley. And on one side of the valley, up on a hillside, is the Israelite army. And on the other, uh, the opposite side of the valley, on the other hillside, is the Philistine army. And every day, morning and evening, the Philistine champion, the big, bad, mean Goliath, he would strut down to the middle of the valley, the valley splitting the two armies, and he would cry out, he'd yell out to the Israelites, asking them to send just one man, send just one opponent, one champion that could take him on in a one-on-one battle. And if that Israelite champion beat Goliath, then the whole Philistine army would become slaves to the Israelites. But... But if Goliath were to defeat that Israelite champion, then the Israelites would become slaves to the Philistines. And the Bible tells us that King Saul, that he would, uh, and the Israelite army, that they were shaken and that they were terrified. They were shaken and terrified, not just scared, they were shaken and terrified as they heard Goliath's words. And this would go on for 40 days until one day someone who showed up was not gripped by fear. Someone showed up that wasn't gripped by fear. And for David, this day would have just started like any other day. He had no idea that this would be the day that changed his life forever. You see, David was the youngest of the eight sons of Jesse. And the majority of David's brothers, they were large, they were strong, they were handsome, they were built for battle. And David, he was the runt. He was small, he was unassuming, but he was God's chosen to be the future king of Israel because while man looks at outward appearance, God, he looks at the heart. 
And so David was a helper to his father. He helped him look after the sheep and he also helped run errands for his father. Three of David's big brothers, they were already off at war. They were already all armored up. They had their swords, they had their shields. And David's father, Jesse, wanted David to bring them some lunch. So here's this scrawny little boy who was to deliver a meal to his three big brothers. He was really the Bible's first Postmates driver. And David's given this little assignment. He was to run this little errand for his father by bringing lunch to his big brothers. It was an ordinary day with a little assignment asked of a little boy. And I keep saying little because I want you to remember that the little things matter. In fact, let's just pause there for one second. We have more ordinary days than we do extraordinary days. At David, he didn't know this was gonna be an extraordinary day. He wasn't in a position of stature or power at this point. He didn't have any big important assignments in front of him. He was gonna bring his best to the little chore asked of him by bringing lunch to his brothers. He was gonna be available, he was gonna be responsive, he was gonna be on time. You see, the little things mattered to David. And God doesn't tell us that when we do this small task or this small chore with excellence that it's gonna change our destiny. No, we have no idea when the little things will lead to big things, but God is grooming you for greatness and it all starts in the little things, the little things that you do with excellence. David had to be trusted with completing a lunch delivery before he was gonna be trusted with a giant. And I do mean giant. Some scholars would say that David was around 4'10", 4'11", definitely under five feet tall, and they would have Goliath between seven and nine feet tall. And I tried to come up with the best analogy, the best modern day example of just how massive this size difference would be. And the best that I could come up with was Shaquille O'Neal taking a picture with Simone Biles. I mean, <laughs> that is a massive size difference. And even this picture is a little bit flawed because Simone Biles is way more ripped than David would have been. He was not a gymnast. He did not have those gymnast muscles. So here's this little David showing up to the battlefield. The Israelites are on one side and the Philistines are on the other. Goliath does his normal taunting of the Israelite army, but this time, this time David heard him and David was mad. We're gonna be in the, in cha uh, the chapter 17 of 1 Samuel and the, verse 26 tells us just how mad David was. It says, he says, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. Who is this pagan Philistine anyways that he's allowed? David wasn't afraid. David was mad. David was ready to fight. David was ready to respond with courage. And for each of us, the question is not if a giant will come into our lives, taunting us, mocking us, trying to stick, strike fear into us and asking for a fight. It's really just a question of when. And maybe you just got through a season of fighting a giant yourself. Maybe you're tired from fighting that giant and you're scared that the next giant's around the corner and you're gonna have to fight them when you're in the most tired stage you've ever been. Or maybe for you, your giant season, your big challenge is right in front of you right now. You're fighting that giant as we speak. Maybe for you, you're in the room today and it's neither of those things. Maybe for you, everything's normal, everything's calm, almost a little too calm. You're a little afraid that around the next corner is the next giant just waiting for you. Well, how do we have the heart and the confidence of David that we're ready to face the giant head on and not be afraid? How do we develop a courageous heart? Well, that's what we're gonna look at today. And the first way that we develop a courageous heart is by remembering our past victories. Remember your past victories. I have a little confession, a little something personal about me, and that is that I am horribly terrified of mice, which is funny because I'm not terrified of like the other animals that people are afraid of. Snakes don't scare me, spiders don't scare me, but if you and I are hanging out and a mouse comes within 20 feet of us, I promise you, I will abandon you. I'm gone. <laughs> And it's this fear that I've tried to overcome over the years. And I can remember several years back when my wife and I were first married, we're in our living room, we're watching TV, and all of a sudden out from underneath the couch, a mouse runs across the living room and underneath the TV stand. I promise you, you've never seen anyone shoot up so fast, climb on top of a chair and just stay there. Now you might say that that's a loss. That was a lot of fear right now. No, this was a victory. Because listen, I didn't leave the room. I didn't leave the house. I didn't burn the place down. I stayed there. 
Now I had to call a friend that was four doors down, uh, my friend Kyle, to come down and get rid of that mouse for me. And my wife so lovingly took a picture of this moment so that I could always remember just how scared I was. But that picture might look like defeat, that picture is a victory, a small victory, but I stayed in the room. Now flash forward to just this last month. I'm at my brother's Jake, my brother Jake's house helping with some home renovations. My friends are there helping as well. I'm in the inside part helping and then they're out in the garage doing some things. When all of a sudden they start calling me to the garage, which come to find out is because they're chasing around a mouse. Now, I wanna assume the best in my friends that they're just trying to help me overcome this fear. They're not trying to torture me. But I get out to the garage, I open the door, I see they're chasing a mouse, I immediately shut the door. And I turn around and I think to myself, like, I'm not going back out there. But here, Nick, this is your chance to try to defeat this fear, to try to deal with it, get back out there, face this mouse. So I take a deep breath, I roll, crack my neck, I loosen my shoulders as if I'm gonna go out and physically fight this mouse. I walk outside and my friends have the mouse moving the right direction. They have a broom and they're chasing it towards the driveway, out of the garage, gone forever. When all of a sudden, because mice are unpredictable, it changes direction, it starts sprinting right at me with those beady little eyes. I knew this is my opportunity to deal with this fear. I gotta turn this mouse around. I gotta get him going the right direction. It's between me and no one else. I took a big gulp. I grabbed a board that was right next to me. I didn't have a whole lot of time to think and I, I went right back inside, I shut that door, I didn't go back outside for several hours. I couldn't do it, I could not face my fear. I lost sight of my past victories when it came to facing mice. But David, he didn't have the same problem that I did. In fact, he's gonna show us how past victories should be used to conquer the fears of today. So here is David, he's on this battlefield and he's ready to fight. And King Saul, he catches wind that this little boy wants to fight this Philistine giant, so he has David brought before him. And check out their conversation in verses 32 and 35. It says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. He's saying there's no way you can win. The size difference alone, you're just a little boy, he's been fighting forever. Look at, look at David's response right here. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. These are not small animals that David had to deal with in his past. These are not mice. These are lions and bears. And I don't mean the football teams because I know neither one of those teams are very scary. These are top (laughs) of the food chain animals. But here's what David is asserting. He's asserting that if he, a little shepherd boy, can defeat a lion or a bear with God on his side, then he is qualified with that same God to take on this Philistine giant. I believe that David's not only trying to retell these stories to convince Saul, but also to convince himself that God will be with him. You see, David realized that the best way to conquer today's fear is by recalling yesterday's victories. The best way to conquer today's fear is by recalling yesterday's victories. If you can handle the lions and the bears, you can defeat giants. And most of us have had to deal with what I'm gonna call or what I'm gonna coin as these wild animal attacks. And what I mean is scary things that seem to be against us, but through God's grace, through God's power, they didn't defeat us. Let's stop and let's look back for just a second. Even stories we've heard from people in the central family. There's Dennis and Macy who were in a financial struggling season. They lost everything, had to start over. But through the faithfulness of God, through serving, they were able to get back on their feet, blessed financially to where today they're back to where they can even be generous to others and give right back to their church. There's Hannah who struggled with issues that caused her marriage to hit rock bottom. But same thing, putting trust in God, leaning on a church family, seeking forgiveness together, their family has never been stronger. There's Enrique who went through a really dark season of his life 
started abusing drugs and alcohol, but came to church, accepted Jesus into his life, found a community and celebrate recovery, and now is six months clean and sober. There's even my own story where when our second daughter, Quinn, was born, the doctors told us that she wasn't gonna make it. She wasn't gonna live. I can remember getting down on my hands and knees and just begging God to do something. I felt like everything was against me. Then through what even the doctors can only explain as a miracle, through God's mercy and grace and power, he healed her. And listen, if God has ever delivered victories over obstacles that you didn't think that you would overcome, if the world tried to knock you down, if the enemy attacked, but he didn't win because God delivered a rescue, then give God praise right now. Don't leave me to be the only one up here recognizing all he's done. He's done so much, he's been so good. And God is carefully orchestrating every moment in your life right now to prepare you for your giant. That's why we rejoice when we face trials, not because they're meant to break us, but because they're meant to prepare us. They're meant to get us ready. These barren lion moments, they don't come with a warning. They don't warn us that they're getting you ready for a giant. You just have to realize you're in basic training for something big. God is gonna do something through you that's specific to you and only you. So stay strong in those barren lion moments. Let them build you for your giant moments. Because even if we feel small and unqualified, we see that God uses those who are small and unqualified to accomplish his purpose. I mean, just look at the contrast between David and King Saul. Everything about this one-on-one -on -one battle with Goliath points to Saul being the Israelite chosen that should have fought him. He was the king, he was a warrior, he was experienced in battle, he was experienced in fighting, he was strong, and the Bible tells us that he was heads above every, everyone else in the Israelite army. If anyone should have stepped up on day one, let alone day 40, to fight this giant, it should have been big, bad King Saul. But in a field watching over sheep, God had already been working on his champion equipping David with everything he was gonna need to defeat this giant, which leads us to the second way that we can develop a heart of courage, and that is to use your own giftings. Use your own giftings. My, my wife, Laura, and I, we grew up as very small kids. We just had small genes. I was 4'11 until my junior year of high school. You can imagine what that, what that was like, just being a very small boy that loved to try to play sports and other things. And we passed these small genes down to our three girls. We just have three small girls for their age. In fact, uh, especially Quinn, she's in the bottom one percentile of height and weight. She has been her whole life. And in this little girl is a really big fight. It's a really big competitive spirit. She loves to play sports. She loves to play soccer. And unfortunately, these soccer leagues, they don't pair you with kids your same size. That would be impossible for them to try to figure out. They put you with kids your age which means that Quinn is always the smallest on the field. And not by just a little bit, like girls twice her size is normally who she's facing. In fact, we have a picture I took from my wife's Instagram, just how big and how small Quinn is on that field. Like that, if you zoom in a little bit closer, that is a David and Goliath moment right there <laughs> that Quinn has to face. And I can remember this one game in particular that the opposing team, the one that was matched up on Quinn, it was this girl that... I don't wanna call a bully, but I will say her style of play just wasn't my favorite. Now, I know we're talking about 10 year olds and she probably saw Quinn's size as a competitive advantage for her, that she could just run right through Quinn, she could knock her down and, and could have no problem with little resistance taking the ball down the field. But there's only so many times as a protective dad that you can watch your little girl get knocked to the ground just kind of getting beat up over and over, just constantly on the ground. And I noticed somewhere in the first half, even Quinn started to get frustrated with her style of play. And then Quinn switched her style of play, which was not a good thing because Quinn thought, maybe if I run into her first, maybe if I try to jump into her and knock her down, I can win this battle. But it wasn't the case because she was so much smaller, every time Quinn would launch herself in the air and this girl would run through her, she would just fall to the ground even harder. So at halftime, I had Quinn come over to me, run over to her dad, and I'm gonna give her this great dad and pastoral advice to really help, help her play kind, help her. It's not the case at all. I'm lying to you. I wanted her to win, and I was gonna help her get the best competitive advantage that she could. So I told her, I said, Quinn, stop 
playing like this other girl. She is much bigger than you. You have to stop playing like that. You've never played like that. Here's what I want you to do. The next time that you have the ball and she's charging towards you, I want you to keep your foot right on the ball, but I want you to move out of the way. Just last second, I want you to move out of the way. And sure enough, the second half starts. Quinn's past the ball. She's taking it down the field. This large girl's running right at her. That brave heart look in her eyes as if she's just gonna take Quinn out. Quinn keeps her foot on the ball, moves out of the way. And because this girl's momentum was gonna go through Quinn, she hits that ball, she trips, she falls to the ground. Tears start coming out. I feel bad because this girl's now hurt. The ref has everybody get down on one knee on the field in recognition of her being hurt. But Quinn just keeps standing there over this girl in kind of amazement. <laughs> then she turns around with a big smile and two thumbs up, looks right at me and says, it worked. I felt every parent's eyes shift on me as if what did you tell your daughter to do? Not my best parenting moment. But Quinn, she was able to have a victory in a battle when she played to her own giftings. And the same is true of David. He has convinced Saul to let him fight. And, and David, and Saul wants David, however, to fight the battle the way that Saul would fight the battle. It tells us in verses 38 through 39, then Saul, he gave his armor, his, David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail, David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. He had never worn such things. And remember, two things we know to be true. David is under five feet tall, 4'10", 4 4'11". 4 Saul is heads above everyone else. David would have been swimming in his armor. I could, I'm surprised he was even able to take a step or two. But look at David's response to Saul. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. Saul tried to equip David with his armor. And here's what we can learn from this. Never try to be someone else. Don't fight like someone else's, else fights. Don't compare yourself to others. Too often we face a giant and we immediately start making comparison statements. Well, if I had their job, I, I, I could take on that giant. If I had their marriage, if my kids acted and, and looked like those kids, if, if I looked like her, if I was strong like him, if I could write like, lead like, sing like, uh, paint like, speak like, have their talents, then I could face that giant. But God equips us with specific gifts so that we can do what he calls us to do. Don't try to use a sword if you're better with a sling. Don't put on someone else's armor that isn't tailor-made for you. Be who God has created you to be and you will find confidence and courage. <laughs> David went back to his roots. He went back to what he knew. If he was gonna face a giant, he was gonna do it with his own God-given giftings. Romans 12, six tells us in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So trust your maker there is something in this world that you were put here to do that only you can do. Which brings us to the last way we can develop a courageous heart, and that's to rely on God. A couple of years back, my youngest daughter, Cosette, she went to the top of this high dive at this swimming pool. And once up there, she got to the top, she got to the edge, and she realized just how high up she was, and fear started to set in. She kind of became frozen. She didn't want to jump off that high dive. And I can remember I was only 30 yards away in a, in a lounge chair, just trying to encourage her to jump, that she's got this. And the line started to back up to the high dive. Other kids wanted to get up and they were starting to get anxious. What felt like 30 minutes probably was only five, but nonetheless, she wasn't jumping. And I'm, I'm trying to encourage her, like you've done scarier things you've got this, you're a great swimmer. Even at that, there's a lifeguard right there. So jump, but she just stayed frozen. And then she finally said, after several minutes, dad, if you just come over right by the diving board, then I'll jump. So I hustled over there and the line is so long by now. And right when I get to the edge of the diving board, she jumps off and into the water. And she swims back over to the edge. The whole line's cheering, probably because they're tired of waiting. They can finally take their turn. 
But she climbs out of the water, she gets out, climbs off the edge, and she tells me, I just felt better with you being right there. I just felt better. Which, this was a beautiful picture to me. That space between that diving board and that water, it was once filled with fear. But she learned to replace that fear and she learned to replace that space with the confidence that she had in a dad. The confidence that she had in her father. And here is David, 4'11", scrawny, little, no fancy weapons, no shield. He's got a staff, he's got five stones, he's got a sling, and across from him is a monster of a man at seven to nine feet tall, all brawn, all muscle. He's huge, he's armored up. And check out what David tells him in verses 45 and 46. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you. I want you to pay attention to the words right there. I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Goliath, you have defied God. Now I wanna go back earlier in the chapter before David even arrived on the scene to verse 25 and check out what the Israelite men were saying when Goliath would yell these words. They, have you, they say, have you seen the giant, the men asked? He comes out each day to defy who? To defy Israel. He comes out to defy us. These same men heard Goliath taunt them day and night for 40 days. That's 80 times. And every single time they heard it as Goliath defying Israel. David heard it once, and he heard it differently. For David, it struck a different chord. David heard Goliath's words as defying God, and he couldn't let that go. He was able to step forward with courage to that giant because he knew he was on God's side. You see, how you hear things matter. The Israelite army, including Saul, he heard it, they heard it and got scared. David heard it and got angry and got brave. David remembered that the same God of the mountain is the same God of the valley. What we hear, it passes through the filter of what we believe before our brains can even process how to respond. What we hear, it processes through this filter of what we believe, what our core, core convictions are before our brain can even process how to respond and how to act. What did David believe in? David believed in the power of God. David believed that God was gonna be with whoever fought that battle. When Goliath was talking smack, David heard him. And what David realizes is, is here is a man who defies God's army. And David rattles off all the things that Goliath has against him. You have spear, you have sword, you have javelin. And David says, I don't have all that, but I have a name. I have God's name and he will defeat you. Then David, David with one stone, just one shot, he had five shots, but he didn't need them. That one shot struck giant, str the giant straight in the head, sent him to the ground and was victorious. He had killed Goliath, David's private life, this small little shepherd boy on a hillside watching over sheep or delivering lunch to his brothers, that life was over. He was now David the champion, David the victor, David the courageous, the giant slayer. His public life would begin. And if, if you're gonna take down the giants in your own life, you need to remember who your God is. When you remind yourself of whose side you're on, when you magnify God, fear can't live in that space. The difference between David being so tiny and Goliath being so big was space that was filled with the presence of a heavenly father. It was the space that God needed to show his power. I mean, just think about it for a second. There's no reason that God couldn't have used a giant to fight a giant. He could have called and anointed a large, powerful man to take on this giant named Goliath. He's God. He could have used and chosen whoever he wanted, but he chose a small boy in stature with a big, courageous heart to show us that when we carry his name, there's no giant too powerful to stand against his people. And I really feel someone in here, you need to hear this today. Because if the devil can convince you that you're small, then you're already defeated. It, it, your stature, it does not define who you are. 
The contents of your wallet, the home you live in, they do not define who you are. Your academics don't define who you are. Your job position doesn't define who you are. Your relationship status does not define who you are. If you feel inferior, under-resourced, incapable, inadequate, then you need to change how you hear things because none of those things are who you are. None of them. God chose a little boy to get into a big fight Replace your fear with courage. Stand before your giant remembering all the barren lion moments, victories that God has given you. Remember to stand in front of that giant confident in who you are and how you're uniquely gifted. Don't try to be someone else. And then rely on God. Carry his name into every battle you face, confident he will see you through. Because wherever you find a giant, right behind it, you're gonna find your greatness. That giant for David, he was the, it was the door that God needed to show David all that he was gonna have in store for his future. When you stand against the giant, God will open something amazing for you. Fear is the greatest barrier to knowing God and fulfilling his purpose for your life. The only thing, the only thing that can conquer a fear mindset is a courageous heart. And you might be in here today and you're thinking to yourself, I didn't even know that there was a God that was for me. Maybe you've been fighting giants all on your own and you're tired of fighting those giants. I want you to know that you have a God, a God that is madly in love with you, a God that is for you, and he wants to be there for you in your barren lion moments, in your giant moments. He wants to be right by your side. He loves you so much so that he sent the only thing that he had his one and only son, to live a perfect life, to die a death that he didn't deserve for you so that he could truly be with you. And if you want, for the very first time, on this Father's Day, maybe you're a dad in the room and you're tired of fighting this on your own. Maybe you're not. You're also tired of just fighting these giants. If you want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do so. All you have to do is repeat these words after me, but this could be your first step of courage. So could I have everybody bow their heads, close their eyes. If you wanna make that commitment today, if you wanna name Jesus your Lord and Savior, just repeat these words after me. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up. I know I'm undeserving of your love but you sent your one and only son for me. He lived a perfect life, died a death that he did not deserve. But he defeated that death. He rose from the grave to forgive me of my sins. I'm tired of fighting these giants alone. Come into my life, Father. I name you my personal Lord my personal savior. And if you made that commitment today, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, if you just slip your hand in the air for me, if everybody could keep their heads bowed, their eyes closed, just slip your hand up into the air. I know this is a giant step of courage, but just recognizing before me, recognizing before God that you're making him the leader of your life today. Thank you for that courage. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. God, I... I lift these hands up to you right now, Father. Be with them. Show them that they now carry your name and they can respond with courage. And I pray that for everyone in the room, Father, that we don't forget that you are a God that is with us and for us. I give you these hands today. I give you these lives. I lift this room up to you. Take them, Father. Lead us and continue to be by our side. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, can you give it up for everyone who made a decision today? Congratulations if you made that decision. And here at Central, we created a a curriculum for you. We created this devotional. It's called a How to Follow Jesus Guide. It's really easy to access. Just go to central.family, click the quick link. I've decided to follow Jesus. This will help you through your first 40 days of this new commitment, partnering with the Bible, just giving you some next steps.